listening to the Progaxia podcast. Surprise me. What year is it supposed to be? It's 1973, almost dinner time. I'm having oops. The best progressive rock of 1973. Hi everybody, it's Andy Phillips here and I've got Paul Gooch me. Hi Paul. Hey, hi Andy. And this is the Progaxia podcast and we're going to be talking about... Well, some of the some of the tracks we did from the show from uh, 1973, I did a part two of 1973. And so if you're watching on YouTube, hi, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I did a part two of 1973. I did two radio shows because there was just too much, too much good music in 73 to uh, just do one show. I've only got two hours on each show. So, uh, yeah, so we did a part part two. And uh, so we're going to talk about some of the tracks in there. And I think the first one that was, well, the very first track that came up was Firth of Fifth, so in England by the Pound. Firth of Fifth, fantastic track. Um, probably one of my favourite tracks on the album. And, yep, what a fantastic album. So, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, that song, so you've got that intro by Tony Banks, and then you've got that guitar solo by Steve Hackett. And um, Hackett's obviously still touring, still playing the song and you know, even before he's doing his Genesis Revisited stuff, you know, he's still playing that song after, where are we, almost 50 years. And he still loves it. I mean, <laughs> we still love it. He still loves it. I mean, if, if there were ever there was a, a perfect solo to try and capture the mood of that song at that moment, I think is it. Um, and I've heard him describe it as, you no, know, he wanted to, why don't you create an image of a bird soaring, you know, just floating on the wind and and but whatever his inspiration was, it works. And and the whole track, I mean, Genesis weren't sort of keen or or Banks wasn't keen allegedly on people having solos, but he had one at the beginning. And uh, as a as a as a very poor pianist, I, I I've tried to learn it, and it's a bit tough, you know. Um, yeah. You've got your thirteen, sixteen. You got your fifteen, sixteen, which warms the cockles of any prog musician's heart with a bit of two four thrown in just to stop you getting bored and oh my word that i mean it it, it comes together so well isn't it i mean one of the reasons one of the reasons why selling england is for so many people their favorite genesis album and one of the favorite prog albums of all time and and first and fifth long with cinema show perfectly encapsulates that for me yeah cinema show was the uh, track i played on part one yeah. And first or fifth on part two, and they're probably the sort of the the best tracks on on that album. But this, so I mean, the whole album is just absolutely superb. It's sort of flawless all the way through. Um, I mean, first or fifth, the, uh, the all the band is credited on mm. the track, but mm. it is a Tony Banks track. I mean, it's a track. Actually, it's a track that he had he, he wrote for Foxtrot. He actually uh, put it forward as a track for Foxtrot. Uh, yeah. Which I, I didn't, I didn't realise until recently. I was speaking to someone and they told me about this, but it was rejected at the time. I suppose because it, it wasn't fully formed or whatever. Um, but he obviously, you know, rebuilt it, rebuilt the arrangement around the original, um, and then the group accepted it. And you saw the rest is history, really. You know, it's. Uh, yeah. I, I know that <sighs> Tony Banks doesn't like the lyrics too much. I think well, the, the ones that Mike Rutherford wrote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because um, he does that <laughs> quite a lot. If you know it's Tony Banks, he doesn't like this and he doesn't like that. Yeah. Uh, but to me, the, the lyrics are perfect. Uh, the way mm. Gabriel sings it is perfect. Mm. Uh, the solo, as you mentioned, from Steve Hackett is just absolutely... Yes. It's probably the best solo of any progressive rock album ever. And that's that's not just you know saying something for for this. Uh, whenever you listen to it, it is just absolutely phenomenal. You know, it's uh, it's just one of those solos that it goes on for quite a while. I mean, it's quite a long solo as well, but it's absolutely mm. flawless. Mm. Uh, and he's, as you say, he's still he's still he's still playing it today. Um, still loving still it. it today, and it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's hard to see where how it would have fitted um, 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 on, on Foxtrot. Of course, you now we say that having grown up with Foxtrot and grown up with uh, Selling England and how they all fit together. But, I mean, I think um, it's a few years later, obviously, but One for the Vine, that was another track that Times of Stan Banks was working on for pretty much a year. So yeah. 
so you know when, when he spends time on something he spends time on it but it's worth it because you know if, if there were two tracks i could play over and over again um for the fifth and uh and one for vine would be two of them um just the way they're constructed and put together um so um but here's the thing so um do, do you think do we think that selling england is a concept album he said no it's pretty much flawless as an album and i know some think that hey you know it's about decline of empire um you know, selling england by the pound the isle of plenty us selling out 73 the time of um um, um oil shortages so people queuing up at garages and so on um yeah, i think there was, there, there was a political um sort of stance to the some of the lyrics i mean if you because it was sort of it was a selling in the by the pound is sort of a, a sort of a parody or a comment at the time about uh, you know what the labor party thought the tories were doing um and i think people were thinking that i don't know the uk was selling out in some way to the us right. you know so and i remember that i remember that remember the times uh so i think yes there, there's 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 some overarching themes along, along these lines and and like with a lot of progressive rock lyrics the it may sound like they're talking about some sort of madrigal thing or a forest mm. somewhere you know? yeah. but it's a bit like rush trees you know the, the the track trees by rush it sounds like they're talking about a forest and things that happened in a forest but it's basically a political statement of the us the oaks over overarching the 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 the, the maple tree you know, so, the Canadians, absolutely, yeah. You know, so it, there's a lot of political stuff in there, and I think that you know, selling them by the pound, just the, the title of it, mm. is a political statement that maybe we were seen as selling out to the US at the time. So yeah, I mean that that is really interesting, you know, because yeah. it's it's not something you normally think about, but uh, that's so, the point. Yeah, is it? Up, basically, yeah, when people talk about you know concept albums, selling in doesn't ever really come up in the conversation. No. Um, and I think with selling England, so Gabriel was becoming you know, perhaps slightly more dominant as well. Um, the a cappella intro that he does to the whole album, I think, is very good. Um, I think I think Battle of Epping Forest gets a bit carried away, but if if Gabriel was thinking of concepts, and um, by the time the next album came around, he kind of had one in his head, didn't he? But um, yeah. yeah, so selling England, just sort of putting it out there, you know, perhaps a concept album, although not often recognised as one. No, I, I think that's a that's a, a good shout. In in as far as it wasn't written as a concept album, it's like a lot of things, you know. But again, thematic, overarching mm. themes, and all that sort of thing. I think exactly. there's there's definitely that in there. Um, yeah. And and then if you if you're you know listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, let us know what you think. You know, if there's uh, it's something that I mean, it's interesting that you know it's recording in Island Studios. Um, but most of it was written in the, at the Una Billing School of Dance in Chessington. I suppose it was because it was yes. a good a good space to, to to rehearse in and things like that. But I've actually heard some demos of uh, of those sessions online somewhere. I mean, I, I can't remember where where I heard them. We, we could probably find them and maybe share them uh, on the channel at some point. And uh, of course, you, I mean, you mentioned something about um, was it Be Betty Swanick? <laughs> The, uh... yeah, but it's like who painted the picture that Tony and Peter saw when they had a trip up to the smoke and liked it so much, they thought, I know what I like, I'll put that on the album cover. Yeah, because it's it was, I know that, uh, I think Tony Banks has still got it in his house. Um, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, uh, but it was, because it was, it was like a modernised version of it, wasn't it? Was it? They, I think they put the, I think the guy was sitting on the, uh, sort of laying on the bench, but I think they put a lawnmower in just to sort of tie in with, I know what I like, you know, the track I know what I like and things like that. So, well, that could be, that could be apocryphal. I really don't know. <laughs> it could be apocryphal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so all in all, fantastic album, fantastic track, probably one of their best tracks. So I think we go on to the next one, and uh, this may be a bit contentious between me and you. I don't know, yes. uh, but it's it's a passion play, Jethro Tull. And on the show, I played um, two acts for that because it's like four acts, and there's some weird thing in the middle. But there's there's four acts in this, um, and I played act one and two. I'm just opening it up for people so you can see the glory of the gatefold. Absolutely beautiful. And it's and it's and it's actually worth pointing out some of the things in that in that gatefold and in the packaging. Yeah, it, it the, the packaging on this is absolutely 
phenomenal. It's it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's an absolutely beautiful thing. It's a work of art. But uh, so I played I played uh, Ronnie Pilgrim's Funeral in the Memory Bank, uh, which was on basically on side one, and uh, on side two there's uh, the business office of G Oddy and Sons. Mm. And uh, well, there's loads of stuff on it. I mean, there's loads of things. I, mean, I can't remember what was on, on what was on the fourth act. I think it was um, drawing room at midnight or something. I can't remember. <laughs> it's, it's basically where he sort of comes out the other side of it. But um, it is a concept album, and it's written specifically as a concept album. And what what's your impressions of it? So when you say he, you're talking about Rodney Pilgrim, I guess, are you? Rodney Pilgrim, yeah. Rodney Pilgrim, yes. Rodney. <laughs> right. So. What do I think? So, uh, so Jeff Rotel, Ian Anderson accused of um, uh, pompous and concept albums with Aquilang, and he said, no, it's not. So I'm going to write the mother of all um, concept albums. And he did so with Thick as a Brick. And I like, I like Thick as a Brick. And um, uh, we, we, I showed the packaging for that um, wonderful newspaper thing. And um, Passion Play doesn't quite stir me in the same way. There's something about it. Um, ah, it doesn't seem to have as much soul to it. Um, it's slightly different. I think it's slightly o over everything. Yeah? And so hang on a minute, we're prog fans. So how could anything be over? But um, yeah, the, the, the amplifier went up beyond 11 on this. So overproduced, overarranged for me, I think. There's some great bits in it. Um, interesting how um, Anderson was doing more sax and flute at this stage. Um, but there's, for anyone who isn't a fan of Jeff Rotel, um, kind of gone off to France, haven't they, for tax reasons? Um, and there's something called uh, Chateau d'Herouville, um, which is a honky chateau for fans of a certain other type of music. Um, the bands had gone there and they went there and it just didn't work out. So Anderson jokingly refers to the Chateau d'Herouville as Chateau Disaster. Um, and um, so the album that they were trying to make, they couldn't make. And they came back to England um, and made this instead. And I think that's part of why I probably don't like it. I didn't know that when I heard all this for the first time. But it just sounds a bit like, let's throw everything at it, um, at it hope it sticks and see what comes out. And uh, we'll call it a passion play. Passion, of course, being um, about suffering and anguish. Um, as in Passion of Christ. So, yeah, I mean, it's got some interesting bits in it, some stuff I like, but is it one of my most played Tal albums? Absolutely not. Um, Aqualung, Minstrel in the Gallery, Thick as a Brick, Benefit, all those other ones, I would play a lot more than this, uh, Andy. So I don't know if that if that is contentious in the, in your Tal world. No, I think I think you're you're basically talking the same sort of language as probably most most Tal fans, and not all of them, but most Tal fans. Um, for me, I think you're completely right. There's uh, there's some absolutely classic, classic, classic Toll stuff. Uh, Thick as a brick is just peerless. It's uh, as we've said last last time we was doing our podcast. Yeah. Um, Thick as a brick is a fantastic, fantastic album. the The thing with this is that although it was sort of a I guess a critically disappointing album. I mean, the critics hated it. Yeah. Um, but I think for many Toll fans, and me included, I think it's a little piece of a masterpiece that gets overlooked a lot. You know, it's, I don't think it's their best album. I think, you know, Figure the Brick is, is probably their best album. But I do think it's a bit of a masterpiece in its own right. Um, and sort of one of my favorites. You know, it, it's, you know, it's, Thick as it was brought out the year before, so it's one of the best concept albums ever made. Mm. And it is. But for me, when I'm listening to this, after all these years, like going back on things, I think this in some ways is sort of better in some ways. Not not in commercial sense, you know. I think, that, uh, you know, this is a little bit more, I don't know, thoughtful, introspective, a little bit more subtle maybe. Uh, but I really, really got into this album, mm. I, and apart from the, the, you know, the story of the Hairless Spectacles, which is that just strange track halfway through, which I think well, really I, spoils I, the flow. I, 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 I yeah. like the track, 
but I just think it really spoils the flow of, you know, if you listen to a concept album, you don't want to put, you know, Uma Puluma Blanca in the middle of it, if you know what I mean. And, um, it, and cool. also, I mean, it also gets cut off on both sides of the by the um, by turning the album over as well. So not only I, I find it an incongruous track, it doesn't work for me. I guess it's an attempt at humour. You know, it's tried to be a bit wordplay, but really, I, I the album would have been richer for it not being on or or put it as a un uncredited track at the end that you discovered. I don't know. No, I totally agree. It's disrupted the flow. I mean, I was, I was struggling with the flow anyway, but yeah, the hair lost his spectacle. My word. Not yeah, I think they should have either ditched it or put it at the end or something like that. But I think I, I guess they they thought they better put some fun in this. You know, <laughs> it's got to yeah. be some sort of you know something to make people smile. Um, but yeah, it was less commercial. Uh, but f for some reason, I just absolutely love this album, and I, and it, and I think it was the time that it, you know that I got it because the, the first album I got was Thick as a Brick, um, yeah. and this was something which I bought not really hearing it not really knowing it and again it's one of those albums that i played for a, i tried to get into it didn't really get into it but it's sort of it's sort of grown over the years and in the last sort of five years i've really 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 got into it you know and it's uh it's just one of those albums that it's, it, there's there's a lot of stuff in there and there's a lot of things to listen to and there's a lot of stuff that I'd, i've never heard before even though i've listened to it quite a few times and i've it's just one of those albums that sort of grows and grows on you. And I think maybe if you listen to it again and just sort of, if it was done by anybody else, um, you know, maybe with not Ian Anderson's vocals on it, but something similar. But if, if someone else had done this, I think it would be held as a, a critically acclaimed, you know, people would be jumping on this and saying, you know, if it was done by no one, you know, a nobody band, just at that time, 73, they brought out this one album. Yeah. Um I think it would be deemed a cult classic. It, I think it's just because it's Jethro Tull and it came after uh, Thick as a Brick that it's it's like people look at it and go, well, it's not as good as Thick as a Brick. But there's some brilliant, brilliant music in there. Some fantastic guitar playing in it. There's, the, you know, the, the the lyrics, if you actually go follow the lyrics through at the same time, yeah. um, it's just really, really interesting. You know, it's just like a really, really interesting sort of, you know, lyrical um yeah lyrical flow it just works so well for me um and of course you know if you if you look at the uh that linwell theater program which you've got yes. yeah um you go through that um it, everything sort of falls together and it just it just i think it's just a brilliant album it's a brilliant brilliant album and also i mean if you think where you know this started up you know you you you, you mentioned this chateau horrorville yeah. um, chateau disaster yeah, Chateau Disaster, but Chateau Horrible is it's a, that is a such a classic place to record as well. I mean, it, it yeah, it didn't work out very well for them, but I mean, it, it, if you think about it, you know, it's such a famous, famous place. I mean, was it Grateful Dead played there? They played on the Meadow and got it recorded on the 16 track. Um, yeah, lots of people, lots of people used it, didn't they? Well, um, you, you, you mentioned Honky Chateau. Well, yeah. Elton John recorded. Yep. Um, Rock Audi Haunted Chateau and uh, T Rex went there. There, T Rex went there. I think Queen went there. I think for a while. Yep. Nectar, Nectar recorded there as well. Uh, Rainbow recorded Long Live Rock and Roll there. <laughs> oh, but yes. Yeah. Um, but and and also one of our favourites, one of our favourites, Gong. Ah, well, and Gong. Air Electric was recorded, yeah. recorded there as well. Um. Yeah, because it was it was it was a, I found out uh, it was a guy called Rex Foster who called it Honky Chateau, right? Um, and because I, 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 I read this a little while back, and I remember going and have a look because I hadn't even heard of Rex Foster, and uh, he's a sort of I guess Dylan S country artist, you know, sort of um, again sort of a, a little Grateful Daddy in places, and you know that sort of stuff. And I started listening to it, and I, and it's not the sort of music I, I like, but I found myself listening to the whole album. It's actually quite good. It's completely different to what I normally listen to. Um, but it was actually quite good. So if you ever get a chance to have a listen to Rex Foster, it is different. It's a sort of country folk American thing. <laughs> it's, it's actually quite good. I, I, yeah, I started listening to the whole bloody thing. But uh, 
yeah i mean it's it, it's it's a it's a bit of bit of a strange strange sort of album you know it's it's uh love it or hate it type thing but it's yeah. it's so tall it's so so tall and so british you know and, and i do love the whole album i really do right so there's two things i think so one is um i think one of the reasons you were talking about the flow of the lyrics and I, and I get that i think the flow of the music for me doesn't work so well um i think it's a bit too um a bit too sort of stage managed you know acoustic bit electric bit acoustic bit electric bit and and to me it doesn't flow as naturally as organically as some of the other stuff so that but hearing you talk about it, I and mean, I've got a theory as to why you like this Tom album. Go on then. And it's probably the most, um, and, and I'm straying into your territory. No, I'm not straying into it. I'm plunging headfirst into it. Um, it's probably the more sort of gentle, giantish type album that Tom did with that interplay, with that everything going on stuff. So there's, there's, there's my theory of the day. This is where the Venn diagram of where, where Tom and Gentle Giant come closest and overlap and therefore that's part of the reason you like it more than i do which is also a way of segueing into gentle giant but that's absolutely that's my theory of the day so okay so gentle gentle giant, giant, um, <laughs> i think that was very professionally done <laughs> i've been practicing my spontaneity all weekend you know uh, it was that was very good uh yeah general giant was the next one um again in this show i put the title track of the the album which is in a glass house Mm. This is the, you know, we, we spoke about this in, in the last podcast, but uh, mm. it was the album where elder brother Phil yep. had moved out. And uh, I think we discussed, you know, the, 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 the process that I thought they went through, which was, you know, it's like they, they were determined to get a proper, you know, a really good gentle giant album out. And um, so, you know, it was, it was on the shoulders of Derek and Ray, to yep. to get that sorted out um which i think on the whole they did really really well you know um i actually i actually really love this album again it's one of those albums that I, yeah i'm a big gentle giant fan anyway fan anyway so yep. um i'm gonna be forgiving no matter what uh but i just think it's i, I think it's a, a a sort of classic gentle giant album uh, begins and ends with the sound of breaking glass, which yes. Yes. to me was like you know you, you could sort of say if you know if you if you wanted to get deep into this stuff was the I don't know, the shattering of the brotherhood or whatever you know <laughs> you could go into, into that sort of deep deepness of it, but um, I don't know I think it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful album I think it's total gentle giant I think the the uh, the two remaining brothers did a an absolutely sterling job. There's some standout tracks on this. The Runaway, which I put on the yeah. the, the part one of, of uh, the best progressive rock of uh, 1973. Experience is brilliant. You know the the title track in the Glass House is good. In fact, I, you know it's all all very good. I'm amazed that they can play this stuff live. To be honest, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, if you listen to it and you, do, and you if even if you're a mu musician, you know you listen to it and you sort of think, how the hell do they do this yeah. live? I think the most surprising thing for me is they didn't get a US release. No. Um, I don't get that. I mean, they, Octopus did so well over there. Yeah, the, the label just wasn't convinced, were they? Um, well, the US label wasn't US, convinced. Sorry, yes, the, US US label, the US um, arm um, weren't, weren't yeah. convinced. Um, but it, it, is, it is a different sound, isn't it? Because I've, I've begun to get... I've begun to get a bit more into Gentle Giant at your urging. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about Crims and the Mighty Crim later. Um, <laughs> what's, one of the things I liked about the earlier stuff, so you know, think about Octopus, which I do like. Um, I found the earlier albums a bit more playful, a bit more. You know, we've talked about the sort of baroque style and um, contrapuntal and how it all knits together, and I, I find that quite interesting, quite playful. Um, this album doesn't come across as such to me. It comes across as a slightly different sound, um, a bit more intense. Um, and yeah, I, it doesn't quite work for me as much as the earlier stuff did. Um, but I, I agree with your points about how the, you know, the two brothers picked up the slack. So if Derek, you're the expert, but I think Derek was the guy that picked up the sax playing. 
Um, and Gary Green, Kerry Benear, weren't they? They were still there. So, um, so I know amongst Gentle Giant fans, this is held up as being you know, one, one of their best. Um, it's just a slightly different Gentle Giant to me. So, yeah, it doesn't quite hit the mark so much. But um, yeah. the, the, this, this track, um, the one that you chose, so you know, having listened to it, yeah, I, I like it. I think it, I think it rocks pretty well, man. Um, it's kind of got some, um, some violin stuff going on and stuff, isn't there? So yeah, so 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 for me it was slightly different. Um, so I need to listen to the whole album again, probably, uh, including the smashing last bit. Um, but am, am I right? There's also a hidden track at the end for all gentle giant fans who drool over on the album. Is that right? There's something about they try and do some sort of melange of all the little um, tracks at the end, some sort of like there's there's yeah right at the end of the album medley or something so don't 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 lift your needle off the um off the platter too soon like, yeah, like yeah. End, basically what it is at the end of the album there's like this um if you go to the radio show on mixcloud for instance my radio show on mixcloud there's a little button that says preview mm. and if you hover over that it does a little one second or two second little preview of bits around the the show. So you can hear, you know, what tracks are on there and things like that. So it's just like a little preview button. It's yeah. sort of like that. There's like these little snippets mm. of each of the tracks as it goes through with glass in there and things like that. And it's just it's just a little bit of this song, a little bit of this song, a little bit of this song, a little bit of this song. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> And it does take you a bit by surprise as well. It took me by surprise to listen to it. I thought a broken record player. <laughs> yes. I thought it was like skipping across the album again. So I, I shot up like a like you know, like anything. When I when I first played it on my record player, I just shot up. I thought, oh my god, what's happened? <laughs> broken my record player. Uh, but yeah, there was that that little one at the end there. But I think it's, I think you're right though. You know, I, I, it, the band. You know, it lost that um, those sax driven driven riffs. Yeah. Um, it lost its a little bit of its mischievous vibe, I guess, yes, you know. Yes, mischievous would be good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, I, I think it did lose a bit of that, you know, so it was a slightly different album. But as I say, I mean, it, it, they just sort of got together and made a really, really tight, definite Gentle Giant album. And, you know, if you can get, if you can sort of put the sort of, the loss of loss of one of the one of the brothers to one side, I think he, it's, it's still a really fantastic, fantastic album you know it's just a, it really is a great great general giant album and i think a lot of a lot of tough a lot of uh, general giant fans would would you know go along with that but, but here's a question for you being the gentle giant guru the ggg um if someone said you know, recommend one gentle giant album for me would this be the one you'd recommend no I, I, it would probably be octopus or freehand. So I'm, yeah. I, I'd probably okay. go freehand because it, there is, it's very accessible. And uh, as I told you um, a million podcasts ago, now yeah. um, it's the one that I it's one of the tracks you know on reflection on, on freehand was one of the tracks that I, I, I found myself whistling down the street. Yes. So that's how much of a of gentle giant fan I can actually whistle some, you know. Yes. Well, you'd be very surprised if someone started whistling it back to you, wouldn't you? <laughs> That would freak me out. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Right. So, so next, next, I want to sort of go on to. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna put a couple of things in. There's a, a, a couple of tracks I put on the show. One was Mahavish Orchestra, One World, and another one was Billy Cobham, uh, Tori and Matador. Yeah. And uh, off the off the Spectrum album. So, I think we probably put those two together in here. and We we'll talk about sort of the, those two things. Yeah. Birds of Fire is one of my my favourite albums ever. <laughs> I yeah. Absolutely love absolutely. Birds of Fire. Yeah. Um, but the album Spectrum, I think if we if we sort of we sort of focus a little bit on on Billy Cobham because we talk about Maher Vishnu quite a lot. Um, but the album Spectrum, this was it was Billy Cobham's first solo album, um, yeah. and it right made a a huge impression on me when I first heard it. Although, I, you know, it, that came out in 73, I was nowhere near um, mature, musically mature enough to listen to it, understand it. I came in after, you know, buying One World and uh, and probably around about sort of 77-ish, I bought One World, maybe 76, I don't know, something like that. Um, and I heard, you know, I knew that Billy Cobham was in there 
uh, because you know you, in them days you sort of sit down with albums and read them through and absorb yes. all the information all that sort of thing so I, I saw a new Billy Cobham's in there and I, and I loved Billy Cobham on that Mad Vishnu Birds of Fire album the drum sound was so different to the rock I was listening to it was it was almost like flowing like a river sort of drumming which is just mind-blowing if you've never heard it um, so if you're not into this sort of fusion stuff then get into this fusion stuff because it, it let it seep into you and it it will blow your mind after a while um but it did make a big impression on me and uh but as i say i was i was nowhere near musically mature at that time to enjoy it so because i was 13 years old and I, I i don't think i would have appreciated it. i would have thought it was probably just noise but so i first heard of billy cobham through mahavishnu and i was at a record shop and I saw this album, Spectrum, sitting in the rack. And it just intrigued me because it was on sale. <laughs> it was one of those things that uh, was on sale. I think it was like a pound in, in the shop. Um, so probably not a massive, mass, massive seller at the time. But uh, I remember getting it home and sort of putting it on. And it starts off with this track called Quadrant 4. And it starts with those those Billy Cobb Billy Cobb double bass drums, and then kicks into this incredibly intoxicating beat, which just just blew my mind straight away. And then this little jaunty tune with Jan Hammer on keys, and and sort of about halfway through it, this guitar solo comes in, which is straight out of the lexicon of rock. You know, it's just it's it was not jazz. It's most of it feels like a jazz album, but. This, this guitar playing that came in, and it was, it, as I say, it's just straight out of the lexicon of rock. It was just a rock, good rock solo. Um, and this was Tommy Bolin. Yep. Now, I didn't know, really know too much about, you know, who was who on a lot of, in a lot of bands at the time. I never really took much notice. That sort of came later as I sort of developing a, developed a, a liking for this. But Tommy Bolin, James Gang, um, he played yep. with um, Deep Purple for a while as well. Which was kind of strange, but yeah. Very, very strange, yeah. But Tommy yeah, Bowen's yeah. guitar yeah. is just mm. incredible. In fact, um, trivia fact for you, <laughs> trivia fact for you, it was it was uh, David Coverdale um, who heard the album Spectrum mm. and suggested Tommy Bowen mm. for Deep Purple because of Spectrum. Yep. And I mean, because Coverdale and Hughes and uh, Bolin had, had kind of similar sort of funk. They had the funk back then, didn't they? Before, yeah. before Coverdale went all MTV, um, got rid of Bernie Marsden for someone who looked good. Sorry, Bernie. Um, so yeah, I mean, but, so I'm, I'm holding this up as a confession because now I don't have the vinyl. I've only got the CD, man. Um, and I, I only heard this probably five or ten years ago. Uh, no more than that. Because you now somebody was saying, you know, if you're going to if you're going to listen to good drummers and listen to a problem spectrum, and it is amazing, it really is fantastic. It's got so much energy. So yeah, so, Tommy Bowling, but but fans of this type of music will also recognise Ron Carter on acoustic bass. You know, there's a guy that's been around a while. And so, so Cobham, I only knew really because um, I was into Mahavishnu. I've, I've spoken before about how glad I was she put um, Birds of Fire on. Um, but Cobham, of course, had been with uh, Miles Davis on Bitches Brew. And this that... is a thing that I don't think many people really get. All of this stuff, all of this stuff comes from, from Miles Davis and, and yeah. it, it, specifically that album. I mean, I've got that album. I've got Bitches yeah. Brew. Um, yeah. Brilliant. And album. it's not an easy listen. But no, I mean, it's a bit different to In a Silent Way or Kind of Cool. Uh, when I say a bit, as in uh, a diametrically opposed, but for him to come out, I know we're not talking primarily here um, about, about Miles Davis, but that was 69, I think, which is true. Um, which is true, I think, yeah. 70, I think came in 70, but yeah, yeah. 69, 70, yeah. Yeah, but that was, came. But I mean, Miles Davis, part of the genius of Miles Davis, you know, him, him reinventing himself, you know, the early bebop stuff to um, the tonal stuff to then Bitches Brew, then he went on to other stuff. But yeah, so Cobham was part of that. Um, and John McCoughlin yeah. on, on Birds of Fire has got uh, Miles Beyond, hasn't he, which he composed in honor of. Absolutely. 
But you, I mean, you're, you're the drummer, but you know, when 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 Bill Bruford and Phil Collins talk about their guiding lights when it came to drumming, they will talk about Billy Common. So yeah, you know, anyone who's listening to this, you know, if you like your drummers, <coughs> if you think Bruford and Phil Collins are good drummers, well, you'd be right. But you know, they they tip their hat to to, to Billy Cobham. As, as others have done. Then there's a guy, the, the tall drummer, isn't it? Danny, Danny, uh, what, Pear, whatever his name is. Anyway, o- others likewise. I mean, the drummer's drummer, I guess. Would that be fair, Andy? You're the, you're the I, drummer. I, I, I think him and a lot of other sort of drummers of that ilk, of that mm-hmm. time. I mean, just, I think one of the things that we could talk, not not talk about um, at length, but just, just mention this, is if you like your music, and you want to try something else. And I say try something else because there's going to be lots of this you don't like. But Bitches Brew, have a listen to Bitches Brew because if you want a progressive album, if you want an album that is doing something which no album has ever done, and I'm serious here, if you, if you want to listen to something which is technically mind-blowing, then and for the time, don't forget, 1970 it came out. 1970 think about the other music that was coming out in 1970 and you take a listen to british uh, uh, bitches brew you've got the way they recorded the drums for instance on almost all the tracks was with two drummers so billy cobham i think it was on the last track of the album i can't remember what it's called now but he's, he's on the one he's one of the drummers on the last track of the album mm. and he's on the left and there's another drummer on the right so imagine would be, this. Would that have been Tony? I'm guessing. Would that be Tony Williams back then? I don't think it was Tony Williams. I can't remember I can't remember exactly who it was. We'll we'll find out for the next podcast and we'll okay. we'll we'll talk about this. But there was the, the, he had he had about six or seven different drummers on the album hmm. and he picked two of them for a track. And and you listen right. to it, when you listen to it on headphones or you know, a good set of speakers, you'll hear one drummer playing something on one one side and another tr- drummer playing something on the other. And Billy Cobham was on the left side on that last thing because it's one of my interests to listen to drums, and it is incredible. No one else has done these things, and he's and he's got he had two two bass players. He had a, 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 an electric bass player and a stand up bass player. Uh, John McLaughlin was on it, you know. So you've yep. got you know Mahavishnu John McLaughlin on there. Um, in fact, didn't he have a track? I think he had a track called actually called John McLaughlin. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Jan Hammer on there, and yeah. Jan Hammer is very, very, very distinctive as a keyboard player. Listen to One World. Listen to you know all the, all the stuff that he's he's on there, um, and also listen to Miami Vice. Yeah, that's unfortunate, yeah. but you know, he's got to make <laughs> the fuck of me. <laughs> And that's that's where he gets his royalties from. It's not from the uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra cells. Uh, yeah, or, or yeah. Bitches Brew. <laughs> but no, seriously, Mar- Miles Davis' Bitches Brew is it's a it's a massively progressive album. Yeah, as I say, quite difficult to listen to because I think he's is 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 uh, playing on it. It's just a bit too honky for me. It's like <laughs> it's a bit all over the bleeding shop. Um, but no, it's, it's an incredible album and, it, and a breakthrough album. So you know, but. Both, well, I, I played uh, Tori and Matador uh, from Spectrum, Billy Com Spectrum album, and that is that is a stonking, stonking track. It's probably one of the best tracks on there. But there's there's also a track on there where he's got um, uh, a synthesizer, which is or you know, like a, it's like they've hit a sequencer and he's got like you know so a sequenced sequenced notes playing yeah. on. And because he, there's a few drum solos on there, but you know they're so musical. It, Billy Cobham is just it's just astounding, you know. But those those little bass drums pumping away in there. He's got a double bass drum in there and loads and loads of snare drum. Um, so just fantastic, fantastic album. If you haven't listened to that and uh, and you know heavy orchestra albums, Birds of Fire and things like that. Well, one, one, one of the things about Tria Matador as well, if anyone hasn't heard it, is um, well, you've got the interplay between uh, the aforementioned Jan Hammer and Tommy Bolin. Um, it's also the, the, the pace, the speed, the tempo. There you go. There's a proper musical word for it. The tempo. I mean, these guys are. are you know, it's 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 pedal to the metal, isn't it? These guys are going for it, and the 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 interplay, and still they've still got some subtlety going on. They've got the little feels that they're all doing. Um, 
which I say I heard Spectrum Marshall, I'd heard Birds of Fire. And one of the things about that and, uh, and the track you picked out on that one as well is these guys' ability to play at pace. Now, Mahavishnu Orchestra, um, this is their second album, wasn't it? They'd actually been touring for a couple of years by then. They'd done the amount of fame. So these guys were, you know, road, road rehearsed and they knew how to play together. But One World as well, you've got the interplay between all of them on that track. Um, that is incredible, yeah. And and um, and even um, basically Rick Laird, even Rick Laird gets a little bit of a time at the spotlight, doesn't he? You know, and now for a bass solo. Um, so, but the, 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 yeah, the guy's ability to—I mean, that surfing at the edge of chaos stuff. You know, Neil Park, um, you know, in, in um, from right to the late great, used to talk about you know, how every live performance was you know just always teetering on the edge, you know, hanging on for dear life as this stuff came together. Um, and and this, this is what these guys pulled off. Now, I know it's a studio, not a live performance, but nevertheless, I mean, yes, their ability to 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 to, to knit this together and hold it together is phenomenal. So if you haven't heard it, put it on loud would be the other thing, yeah, and just sit there and go, ah, I I can't do that. <laughs> there ain't many people that can, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic album. Mm. Next one up. Well, um, yeah. Nectar. Oh, yes. Remember the future. <laughs> mm. um, this this is one of those albums that it probably isn't at the... Uh, I don't think it's probably a most progressive rock fan collections. And, and I would say because it's not that progressive compared to others. I can see you smiling at me there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I liked Tab in the Ocean and um, and I like psych stuff. Um, but this for me took a bit of a step back for me, um, a little bit rockier, a little bit sort of more, hey, let's make it a bit more pro tune, a bit, bit more radio friendly, perhaps. Um, you know, people don't know if we're German or not, and we're not. But, um, you know, maybe yeah, if we're not German, <laughs> uh, yeah, US airplay, that, that could be a road to riches. Um, so, yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I don't think this features highly on their best of, uh, I'm sure we've all got our best of Nectar compilation CDs, don't we? Um, I don't think this features as highly as some of the other stuff they did, frankly. Um, and the vocals certainly don't work for me. But yeah, the, gen the general vibe, I like I like Nectar. Nectar is sort of a bit, not, not guilty pleasure, but um, I didn't really come across them until about 15 years or so ago and thought, these are great. Um, I just don't think this is a great album. This isn't in my top 10 or top I'm afraid there's my, there's my I'll fess up straight away on that one. No, that's that's absolutely fine. And, and this is what you know, I, I, I speak to people a lot about you know, different things that are going on in Prague and stuff like that. And uh, every so often you come across a Nectar fan, which is not not maz amazingly usual. Yeah. Nectar is one of those sort of you know, you have these like primary, secondary, and tertiary yeah. bands, and they come sort of tertiary and maybe. Maybe even a little bit below that sometimes in yeah. in people's sort of radar of prog, um, but this album um, it, there's a little problem because I know exactly what you're talking about. It's not their best album, and I get that completely. The reason why I put it on is because it was actually the first the first Nectar album that I bought, and there's only two tracks on it you know, sort of 16, 17 minutes or whatever it is. Yep. Um, and I've got to make a bit of confession. I actually put on side two first thinking it was side one. <laughs> so so <laughs> my, the, the, the reason why I played Back to the Future Part 2, uh, sorry, Remember the Future, Back to the Future, Remember the Future Part 2 was because it was the first track I'd ever played of Nectar. And, uh, and for some reason, it just, I just liked it, you know, um, Oh, where's he going? Hello. Sorry about that. Sorry. He disappeared for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone yeah, yeah. yeah so it was, oh, it, was the first, it was the first track that I ever played of the first next album I ever bought. Oh, okay. um, so it sort of holds a little golden little piece in my heart inside. Oh. Um, but it is it is a very mellow album. Uh, it's sort of like, um, I think you could call it sort of easy listening prog. Yeah, uh, easy, of, yeah, it's easy listening, easy 
easy space, easy. It's not it's not the deepest realms of space. This is just up in the ozone layer, really, yeah. isn't it? We're not going yeah. into deep, we're not going to gong territory with this one. You see what I did there? Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's 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 the acceptable face of psych rock. Yes, sound. it is the acceptable yeah. face, and I think it's. But sometimes, you know, for me, it's it's just nice to put on something which is isn't challenging. You know, I know that a lot of lot of us in in that like progressive rock music, we put it on because it's challenging, and we're going to talk about. You know, we, we're talking about King Crimson later, and we talk we've talked about your know, sort of, you know, Genesis and Yes, and how challenging that can be sometimes. You know, when you're young and listening to this for the first time. Um, but th for for me, this this was just one of those albums that I remember buying, putting on, and it was in the summer. And I'm, I, I it, you know, it evokes memories albums. Yeah. And I remember putting this on, and I was in my bedroom, opened my window. It's a beautiful spring day. Breeze was coming in. I was chilling out. I was chilling out. <laughs> <laughs> And I put this on, and this just floated through the ether, and it was it, it, it's, it was fantastic at the time, you know. So, some, uh, some, some beautiful and guitar work yeah. on there. There's some great keyboards on there. Um, you mentioned you didn't like the vocals. I think there's some really really cool vocal harmony stuff on there. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of psychedelic rock, yeah. but not not that psychedelic. So you know, it's it's and it, there's some funky bits in there, and there's. It's it's a weird weird album, uh, but I just I just really really enjoyed it, you know. Um, but um, so um, that was that was our podcast. Andy Phillips taking us down nostalgia. Nostalgia isn't what it used to be, is it, Andy? You, it, uh, it certainly isn't. No, you were going <laughs> down. Got no idea about nostalgia. <laughs> you were going down memory lane there. I'm, I'm full of segues today. You're going down memory lane. Um, but but. What what would what would warm the heart of every prog fan is that I think for the third, arguably third time, we that's a concept album, isn't it? We've got another concept album yep. because it's about it's about bluebird, um, and yeah. But I I don't think I've ever seen this album come up in a list of let's talk about concept albums type discussions. Um, so we're back to your primary, secondary, and tertiary, or whatever the one is after tertiary. Some clever word we don't know so yeah I, I mean, look, the, the, the thing is it is a it is a concept album it's a loose concept it album. yeah and it sort of follows that same um same as their sort of you know their their debut album 71 debut album, journey to the center of the eye yeah uh, which is all about extraterrestrials you know yeah. um offering the human race some sort of insight and cosmic knowledge thing you mm. know it was, it was sort of similar to that sort of, that sort of thing but yeah but you know one thing that's better than a concept album, Andy? What's that, mate? It's a concept trilogy of albums. Ooh. Hey. You're good at segues, mate. I've got to say, I you have... I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on... It's, yeah, so... Cause you what are on you fire. Now? You are on fire with, with segues. Our trilogy of concept albums, which is, yes, Angel's Egg. Angel's Egg by Gong. Radio Gnome 2, flying. This is this is coming on from Flying Teapot. Yeah. Uh, before we get to you, so Zero the Hero is continuing his his, his journey through the uh, outer reaches of the uh, of the of the multiverse. Um, um, so, I've yeah. got to tell you, Paul. I, I'm I'm really impressed because most people have no clue it's part of a trilogy. They have no oh. clue. Really? Oh yeah. no! Radio and Home Invisible trilogy. They've got no clue. <laughs> you have, and I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and ah, uh, well, see, I'm I'm I'm, I'm a Gong fan, I'm, and you know, we've spoken about Camembert Electric, but I mean, I mean, if uh, yeah, if you like your space psyche stuff, then you know, this, listen to this. I mean, there's some uh, this this to me is the. Um, great lineup of Gong because this is when Pierre Merlin joined and um, and I mean there's, there's some discussion in Gong circles because he then went on to do Pierre Merlin's Gong and you know, there was some problems with that etc. Big band splits yeah. yeah. Um, Mike Howlett is there as well um, but the 
the, the way that, I mean, it gels together in a very different way to the Mahavishnu or the Spectrum, um, Billy Cobham stuff we've been talking about. But Steve Hillage's guitar work, I mean, I'm a big fan of Hillage. Um, yeah. You've got you know, Didier Malherbe, and uh, you've just got just the right interjections of sounds. You've got a bit of space whispering because you always do, because it's gone. Um, but you've got a story and you've got a bit of fun as well when Zero the Hero finds himself in some Parisian bar and they have a bit of a sing song, which works for some people and doesn't for others. But uh, it's, you, 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 I, I would contend that you can't help but smile. And it puts you in a good, happy place, regardless of how relaxed you may be with the aid of any other stimulant. You can't be, be in a happy place listening to stuff like this because it is, it is fantastic. Yeah, all, all of this it's stuff, fantastic. Gong in general, um, has been a massive, massive part of my life. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of late seventies for me. Uh, I was sort of, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, that sort of thing. I was born in 1960, so you can work out the uh, the math on this. Yep. Um, but my my sort of mid to late teenage years um, was enjoying myself. And enjoying yep. means many things to different people. I think you probably get the drift of where I'm going with this. Yeah. Um, but enjoying myself, listening to Gong was probably every Sunday afternoon, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, sitting in the garden in the summer, bit of gong, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. and, 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 and to me, the, it, they are so, so different. I mean, they, they come out the Canterbury scene. They're, they were part of that whole thing, you know, right at the beginning, but it's, it's the music. I mean, if you've not heard gong uh, and I know there's, there's people who listen to this, who don't know some of the, some of the bands, if you don't know gong, it's hippie, spacey, it's floaty, it's weird. It's utterly brilliant. Mm. Um, you've got, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, Bloom de Mont, Bloom, <laughs> Bloom de Lo, de Bloom de Grass. De Grass and Didier yeah. and, uh, and um, yeah. But, you know, it, this is basically sort of put together by David Allen. Um, yeah. In fact, it was put together by David Allen and Gillet Smith. <laughs> now this is something which you've yeah. got to get your head around because um, a lot of people call a gilly, <laughs> um, but it's it's there's it, uh, David Allen. There was a song by David Allen because you know, um, she's passed away now, um, 2016, I think it was, and uh, David Allen did a a sort of track as a memorial to her life. And he calls her Gillet, Gillet, Gillet. But uh, she was brilliant. Space Whispers, they space used to call whispers. it. Space Whispers. Shaktioni um, and the Space Whispers. Shaktioni. Shaktioni. And there's a picture, oh, it's, to a young boy, it's really quite rude. There's a picture of um, Shaktioni. Um, but I'm just looking, I mean, there's some wonderful little artwork on the back, which is, uh, it sums it up, it's all playful, and, you know, so we're talking about Side 2 with Oily Way, which has got some wonderful flute stuff on it by Didier de Malheur. But yeah, just, just reading the description off the back, Andy. Zero is at last here and now on Planet Gong itself, and the pothead pixies greet him with a full account of how teapots fly through space. <laughs> Prophetic dance of Wizard of the Keys. <laughs> This is a one, and it was recorded um, in France at full moon, August 1973. Of course, it was. You know, Captain Capricorn puts up his umbrella. I mean, it's a wonderful world to live in. So, you know, give yourself 45 minutes to go and inhabit the world of Planet Gong, um, yeah. or, or three times 45 minutes, so two hours, and go through the trilogy. And uh, love it. Absolutely love it. And and the thing is, there is a there, when you listen to it, although it was a you know they, they, the Canterbury scene sort of started, the, these guys were part of the the beginning of that Canterbury scene. But they they're not a Canterbury type band. They are Gong. They are completely different to anything anything else. And you know they have a very very French vibe. You know the the yeah. They were formed in Paris, uh, around about sort of 67, you know, so, um, th and there's a lot of, there's a lot of French vibe in this. This is, this, it, like a, um, a, 
a crossover between sort of something that's very, very English and very, very French. Led by an Australian. Led by an Australian. Yeah. <laughs> Who couldn't get a visa and therefore had to uh, stay in France and um, and set up the commune. Well, this, this is this is the thing. This is the, the fortuitous thing, you know. Yeah. Um, because it, 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 he David Allen was it was like the 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 first guy in soft machine. I mean, he was like the you know in, in the in the first lineup of soft machine. I don't think he ever got to album. I don't think he ever got to album. No. No. But he was in the, the first lineup of soft machine. So you had Robert Wyatt and Kevin Ayers and David Allen. <laughs> Yeah, you know I mean? that is a that is a you know as 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 they started soft machine and uh, or the soft machine, and I, I just wish they'd got no album. I I think that would have been absolutely stunning for that. And the only reason why he couldn't carry on was because he he got turned away at the border because he, yeah. he had yeah. to go back back to Paris. You know, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it's a fortuitous thing, you know. And that's what that's what life's all about. So we went back to Paris, Wong yeah. Gong. Um, but uh, Shelley Smith was was with him at the time. So they, I don't know whether it, they, they've, just, they've just been sort of kindred spirits all the years. I don't know if they were lovers or I don't really know. But oh, I'd, um, I'd, I'd, be surprised, I'd be surprised if they weren't. I reckon they were making sweet music together on many levels, man. Yeah. And then, then when they weren't, I think they were just like incredibly good friends and just yeah. like, you know, just. One, it's like having you know, one's a right arm, one's a left arm. You know, I mean, it's just that they seem to be the the, the key to gong, yeah. David Allen and, and Julie Smith. You know, so, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it is probably, I mean, the the soul trilogy and that whole time of gong, I think, is just literally out of this world. I mean, it's just yeah. it, you, you do go somewhere else. Yeah, you and know, this is the. Yeah, this was this is their zenith because after that, you know, because Hinnich went off and he was doing um, Fish Rising, wasn't he, and stuff like that, and went on to do his stuff. Um, and Hinnich for me is such an important part of of, of Gong. And I say you, had, yeah, you then had, had Captain Hillage, <laughs> Captain Hillage, and yeah, you had because then you had Pierre Merlin's Gong, you had Mother Gong, New York Gong, and it. And okay, so it, it's a community of of Gong music that it just kind of lost its focus and. And people, um, when you first hear this, may think, may say, is this really focused? It seems a bit rambling and a bit free form and stuff. But certainly, I don't think there's any doubt in David Allen's mind, it was focused. Now, he's quite clear what he's doing with the story of Zero the Hero, spreading the word through Radio Gnome, Invisible, and the Pothead Pixies, and the Octave Doctors, and they're all part of the story. If you love storytelling, and you probably do, I'll say it again, go to Planet Gong for a couple of hours of your life. Yeah. No, it's perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, and it's like a lot of other things in, you know, with different bands, you have these periods where they just hit it full on and just yeah. it was just perfect at that time, you know. And I think this trilogy was is one of those times. It was those three albums. I, I was, was, was just thinking, looking at these albums, I mean, some of it's obviously as a point in time, 73. But for most of these groups we're talking about, now we're talking about their fourth or fifth studio album. So, you know, they've kind of worked out who they are, what their best lineup is, you know, who was going to fit, who wasn't going to fit. So, you know, they, they're out in their teenage years. You know, they're, they, these are now, you know, young adults or, or mature adults who, who, who know what they're about. And I think that comes through. So, yeah, the bands we've been talking about are fourth or fifth albums, aren't they? Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to the first part of this podcast. The second part will include in-depth discussion of King Crimson's Lark's Tongues in Aspic, and you and I from the Close to the Edge album by Yes, the track Future City from Inside from the band Eloy, and Memory Lane from Caravan off the album For Girls Who Grow Plump in the Night. We'll stick a link in the description below this podcast so you can go straight to it. We'll see you there.